Hi, you're listening to Java with Jen with your host, Jenna Lee Samuel. On this show, I bring the simplicity of hearing God's voice into everyday life in a no-nonsense, authentic, and super practical way. With coffee in hand and real life in our faces, let's do this. Hey, busy mama. I know you may have so many dreams bubbling in your soul, and I want to propose that podcasting could be a good way to get started. If you're a born communicator, a teacher, mentor, or you just have a message you want to get into the world, sitting behind a mic is a really low pressure, low risk way to get started and make a mark. I want to introduce my podcast plan mastermind. It's a 10 week journey designed for you with bite sized steps that fit perfectly into your busy schedule. In just about five hours a week, you'll have your podcast live literally by Thanksgiving. No joke. I want to invite you to join my supportive, pressure-free space where you will be coached by me to unleash your message into the world. One of my recent students hit number 55 on the U.S. charts within just two months of launching her show, and that's not easy to do. And another, working 70 to 90 hours a week, is already reaching listeners in almost a dozen countries. I've created the coaching experience that I I really wish I had when I started, and I've packed it with secrets on creating, growing, and monetizing your podcast. Are you ready to turn your dreams into a reality? Let's chat. You can ask all your questions at javawithjenpodcast.org to book a call with me because your voice deserves to be heard, and I want to help you build your dreams and make them a reality. Hey there. Hey, welcome back to another episode at Java with Jen. You are in a series that we started last week, which was how can busy moms build their dreams? I get this question all the time about how did you do what you do? How did you build a successful globally ranked podcast as a mom and a pastor? How did you build a coaching program? How did you build a podcast network? How did you build a styling business? How did you help these other businesses? How did you do anything? When you have all these kids coming out your ears. (laughs) And so because I get that question a lot, I decided, hey, I might as well share from you, share with you from my wins and my failures so that you can learn because I am a firm believer that all of us have multiple layers to who we are and what we have to bring to the world. And if you're a mother, that is a high calling and it is one of your primary gifts and responsibilities in life throughout your life. And it is one of the best ways to leave an an impression and an impact in the world. It's called creating legacy, right? But there are other things we want to put our hands to, maybe other giftings that you have, other people that you want to serve and finding out how to do that alongside motherhood can be kind of tricky. So I took some questions from you guys where y'all shared like, Hey, here's some of the things that I'm kind of specifically wondering. I shared them on social media on Java with Jen at Instagram at Java with Jen. So if you don't follow me there, make sure that you are because I'm very regular in my stories and I'll put polls and questions and updates and all kinds of stuff in there. Uh, Even like life hacks and and products that I love, I'll throw in my stories. So you definitely want to be following me on Instagram. And um, that is where I got a lot of these questions from y'all. So I'm going to dive into these. These were the things that you would ask, or many of you have asked about building your dream as a busy mother. So the first question that I come to is how do you prioritize your time and choose your best yes? Which I noticed when I was reading all these questions, how I manage my time was really kind of a common theme in the questions. And so I realized as moms, (laughs) we don't have an abundance of time and our time doesn't really belong to us, it feels like. So you do have to be strategic. And in last episode, I did share how knowing your season and having realistic expectations for what you're able to do in your season is really important. I did share that I didn't really start 
building my podcast until my youngest was five, my oldest was 11, and they were all in school. I could have done it when they were younger, now that I know what I know, um, but I I didn't because I actually was doing more ministry stuff during that time, and I was working at the church a couple days a week. And so there are different things that you'll have capacity for in different seasons of your child's maturity, and depending on how many kids you have and whatever. So let's answer this question which that was kind of my first response is know your season and where your yes is well-deserved. Okay. So there was a season when my kids were younger and I started working at stitch fix. And that was around the time when they were all getting into school. The older ones were there. My youngest was getting into school and I started working for stitch fix as a stylist. So that was 15 to 20 hours a week of work. Plus I had already been doing a couple days a week at the church, working with our college ministry. So there was that. And then I was also active at church on the worship team, Wednesday nights, Sunday mornings. And so the mistake that I made is I didn't respect my season when I took on that job. I thought I could keep working for free at the church two days a week and work my job as a stylist and do all the things I was doing and run my household and somehow stay sane. And that really was not wisdom. I realized in retrospect when I almost burned myself out and got into a very unhealthy place emotionally and physically that sometimes when you pick up something new, it means you have to put something else down. And that's called choosing your best yes. You can only say yes to so many things. And so by default, when you say yes to something, you are probably going to have to say no to something else. Now, that may mean something like I'm saying yes to starting a podcast I'm going to say no to binge watching Netflix for two hours every night. That would be a reasonable no. That's not costing or it's not making anything suffer, right? So know your season, know what is appropriate and where your yes is deserved. When my kids were really little, all I really did outside of raising my children, because that was a very all consuming, I had four of them within six years and I was literally had three in diapers at one time. It was madness. And my husband was in ministry. And so we both were, but he was actively in ministry. So he was very busy all the time. I felt like a single parent a lot of the time. So I just didn't have the capacity to do a whole lot. So what I did do is I think I helped on the worship team that wasn't very demanding. And then I would have college students over to my house whenever they wanted to hang out and get mentorship and stuff. And so that was just one, two girls at a time. And they would oftentimes help me with my laundry, help me with the kids. So it it was a mutually beneficial um, offering in that season of my life. And so I did that for quite really the first five years of my youngest, my youngest son's life was mostly just college ministry. I didn't plan events. I didn't do a lot of logistical stuff. I just mentored girls. That's what I had the capacity for. As my son got older is when I took on the part-time job and started my podcast, which I actually did both of those around the same time. And so that was more doable in my season of life. Once they all went to school, man, I felt like I felt like I rediscovered life. I felt like I got to reinvent myself. My kids are all in school. What am I going to do with my life? It literally is a very different season. I, I literally felt like the world was opening up to me. It was amazing. Um, And so, and I loved having those little years. I'm really glad. So, 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 so glad when the kids were little, I was dying for some way to contribute financially to the household, but I didn't have a college degree and I didn't have the capacity to go work a job that was going to pay well enough to make it worth it with childcare expenses. And so back then I wished I could have worked, but in looking back, I'm so grateful that I wasn't building a business And that I wasn't working during that time because my memories are of entertaining my kids, doing play dates with them, doing play dates with their friends, doing crazy backyard stuff to keep them busy. And those are the special memories that made up their childhood and my my memories of their little years. So I'm really, really grateful in looking back that that's what I had to work with. In the middle of it, it felt like that season would never end and that that's all my life would ever be because I hadn't experienced older children yet. Now that I've had older children, I realized those years are short. I was hated when people told me that. I felt so rude. They're, the days are long, the years are short. So it does pass. And so enjoy really those first five years of their life. They're the most crucial years and they're the busiest years. And once they get in school, things really begin to open up to you. So just hang in there for those first five years and don't expect a whole lot of yourself outside of 
raising kids, or if you are working, working and raising kids. Um, okay. So that would be my first response to that. How do you prioritize your time and choose your best? Yes is know your season and where your yes is well-deserved, where it's going to benefit the season that you're in. Uh, secondly would be follow the favor and honor that is present in your life. So you have to be careful with this still because there may be a lot of people favoring you and honoring you and saying, hey, help us with this. You'd be great at this. You'd be great at this. You still have to know you have to pay attention to your gut and your gut will tell you like when you start to take on something that's beyond your capacity, your gut will have resistance. It'll be like, Ooh, I don't think I can do that. You know, you need to pay attention to that. I did not pay attention to that. I kept talking myself past that. And that was actually very foolish because that's how I got into burnout. So you do need to pay attention to your gut, but paying attention to what I meant by follow the favor and the honor is like show where the Lord is releasing his favor. Because sometimes the Lord will ask us to do something that feels like it's beyond our capacity and he's doing it on purpose. He wants to stretch us. He wants to grow us. And so in those moments, we have to choose to believe God, I believe your grace is going to be sufficient. So, but you have to do your part to be wise if your time is very demanded, you have to make sure you're caring for your health, caring for your rest and those sorts of things. Um, also, how do you prioritize your time and choose your best? Yes, pay attention to what your giftings and callings are and prioritize those things. Just doing willy nilly, whatever looks interesting might not be the best use of your time because it's not building you and the way you're designed and it's not building necessarily possibly the call of God on your life. That's not to say that Working as a waitress for a season doesn't have its place, but I'm just saying if you have an abundance of options, prioritize the things that play to your natural giftings and the calling of God on your life, because you will be developing important skill sets in those spaces. Okay, so question number two, how do you find time to get away and rest? I like this question because I feel like this is one thing I've actually done pretty well. Uh, there's plenty of things I don't think I did very well, but there, this, I feel like I did pretty well. And so I don't like to feel like I'm overwhelmed with life. So I'm pretty good at being aware of what I need and stepping away. To me, it is important to feel good. You can't feel good if you're not exercising somehow, some way, exercising, spending time with people that fill you up. And filling your mind with things that, that feed your spirit and feed your soul. So that's part of knowing yourself. And that'd be my first response. You have to know yourself and be self-aware. You need to know when your tank is running low and maybe you need to get away and get girl time, or maybe you need to go on a date with your husband, or maybe you just need to get away from anybody and everybody where no one is asking for anything. Right. Um, my family is from out of state. I mentioned this in the last episode. And so one thing that was very important to me when we first got married, I guess my husband didn't think about the fact that, hey, I'm taking my wife away from her family that she's very close to. I should probably take her to see her family. Well, that was not a, an important thing for him. And so he came from kind of dysfunctional family. So he didn't understand it being important let's go see our family. And so since it was expensive to take all of us and he doesn't really care to travel, he just, it was not a priority to him to go see my family. So in almost 20 years of marriage, he's taken me twice <laughs> to see my family. So I decided early on, this is not going to happen if I'm waiting on him to make it happen. It has to be me make it, making it happen because it was important to me to see my family. And that was part of getting away and resting. And so I just built in as a tradition, every summer, and my birthday's in July, so it works out great. My twin sister, I just say, I'm going to go see my twin sister for our birthday. And sometimes it's on our birthday, sometimes it's not. But I go and I see my sisters and my parents and my family once a year in the summer. And I don't take the kids. I don't take my husband. It's a me vacation. And I enjoy it. And part of the reason we don't take everyone is because it's just really expensive to travel with a family of six. Um, but I also want to enjoy it. You know, when you take your kids on a trip, it's not the same level of refreshing because you've got to make sure everything's taken care of and do all the things. So that is one of my getaways. It's a girl's trip every single year. It's built in. Maybe you have best friends or sisters or family that you could get away once a year and go on a girl's trip. It may not be as long as mine. I go for two weeks usually. It may be just a long weekend, but building in kind of the tradition of something you can look forward to that 
is for you and for your health, it's just a good thing. So that's a major thing that I do. Other than that, on more of a small scale, when my kids were little, one way that I used to get away is when I would go grocery shopping, I used to do extreme couponing. So I would go like six places. So I would be gone for three or four hours. I really enjoyed that. Then I don't like it anymore, but I did like it then because it meant I could get out of the house. So I would do it when my husband could keep the kids and I would take my sweet time and I would go wherever I wanted and I would spend as long as I wanted and I would get Starbucks and I just made it time for me to kind of unwind. That was probably the most consistent thing I did when the kids were little to tend to me. And some would argue it, that's not really resting because you're still grocery shopping. I know, but I didn't hate grocery shopping then. And it's still, I don't know, it just works for me. So do what's going to work for you. <clears throat> Another thing I did when the kids were really little is we would do once a month mom nights with friends at church. It was just something I came up with. I was like a bunch of the girls, we were all the same age bracket. We all had young children. I said, Hey girls, let's all get together at so-and-so's house on Friday night. Let's meet up at like 8 PM. And we would stay there till literally 2 a.m. sometimes. And we would bring snacks and we would just make coffee and sit around and talk for like hours. It was so fun. It was so much fun. We would do facials. We would sing songs. Sometimes we would dance. We did like a little baby showery thing for me one year. And it was just a lot of fun. And I didn't realize how much that fed all of our souls until I left that church and nobody else initiated that. And friends would be like, I miss our mom nights. No one hosts those because you left. And I was like, oh, and so that was actually really meaningful. That was about once a month, every six weeks. Another thing that I did is when I had mom friends who had little ones every single week, I would build in play dates because my kids were in school. We're not in school yet. And keeping them occupied during the day was crazy four boys, they'd get so bored in the house. So it was not hard to have play dates. We would have play dates multiple times a week sometimes. And, and there was one summer where I designated the days of the week. Monday was make it Monday. And so we would build like, I, I, we would explore building something, either making a recipe or uh, making a craft or whatever. We'd have chores in the morning. We'd have Bible time. I, I kind of built in a structure. That was the most successful summer, I think, was when I put in the structure and built in the theme days. And then multiple days in the week, Friday was fun Friday, and we would go and we would have fun with somebody Tuesday and Thursday were like, think about it Tuesday and um, something else Thursday. I don't know. And wet Wednesday. So wet Wednesday, we would do something outside water. We'd go to water park. We'd go to the beach. We'd turn on the sprinklers in the backyard. We'd do a slip and slide. We'd do something wet and uh, we would have friends over for that. So honestly, I had mom friends over at my house all the time. <laughs> and it helped me not experience that mom loneliness and it helped feed my soul. It kept my kids occupied. It was just a win all the way around. So to be honest, I don't know why moms, more moms don't do that on a regular basis. So those are some of the things that I did um, to help find time to, to rest and soothe my soul. Even if I wasn't getting away, some of it, of course, is getting away. Some of it was not. And so those are things I would do. And then there have been times if I was just maxed out, let's say I had the kids all day long and I would message my husband and say, if you don't come home, you're only going to have three children because I'm going to kill one of them. And I don't know who it will be. And he was like, okay, I'm coming. And so I would say, I need two hours to myself. I'm leaving. You take the kids. I'm going. And I would just go either take myself to dinner or wander target as every mom does or whatever. I would go park by the river anything like that. But the point is you have to know yourself and you have to communicate what your needs are so that they can get met and you need to build it in. Um, you can even build in morning workouts. I had a friend who'd come over and we would go walking on like three days a week or something. We'd, we'd get up a little earlier than the kids and we would walk the neighborhood and it, it was, it built in social time and a workout. It was really great. Um, Keep in mind that you're, a woman's mind is like a web browser with a thousand tabs open, right? And if you don't slow down and close some of those tabs, the mental load of all that background activity will slow down the entire operation, right? Actually share this analogy with your husband because it may help him understand your mental load better. Men are able to compartmentalize their brains 
and they get stuck in one box. They don't understand what it's like that your dinner plans, how you feel about your husband, the fact that you had to spank your kid 27 times today, the fact that you're frustrated, you put on some weight, that all of those can happen in your brain at the same time. <laughs> Guys don't experience that. And so the fact that we can do so much in our mind is a superpower, but it also can wear us out. And so it's important, especially this little simple discipline is helpful. You have to intentionally shut down on purpose at the end of the day to help your body recover. So your cortisol, which is the stress hormone at night, it decreases as you sleep. But I've noticed my cortisol does not really totally go down until the last hour and a half of my sleep if I'm getting seven and a half hours of sleep. So it's like my cortisol doesn't really show much of a difference for at least six hours of sleep. I have to sleep a full night to get the benefit. Well, if you're going to bed and you're scrolling on your phone, you're doing a lot of research, you're studying, you're working, you are not resting your mind or even processing your day, your cortisol cannot drop. And so it's important to take, I don't know, 30 minutes before bed, Maybe even the hour before bed, go on a little walk, a 10 minute walk. That's very, very de-stressing. I, sometimes Stephen and I will do that once the sun is down and the kids are in bed. We'll just go on a little 10, 15, 20 minute walk to kind of unwind a little. And then I have to be very disciplined when I get in bed to pick up my journal or pick up a book, make a cup of tea and just unwind a little bit. And that was actually a discipline that the Holy Spirit taught me to do because when I was in burnout, he was convicting me that I was not building rest into my life at all. I was working all the way up until 1030 in bed. I would close my laptop and lay down and go to sleep. And so my brain never slowed down. My brain was never able to process the day. My subconscious mind was spinning with data and information while I slept. It, it was not courteous to my body or my soul. So I built in a bedtime unwind process where after the kids are in bed, I would take 30 minutes to an hour and simply choose not to get on my phone, which I'm not hundred percent on that. I, I suck at it sometimes just being honest. Um, but when I'm intentional, I'll make a cup of tea, get my journal or my book, write down my gratitudes for the day, process the day, read a little bit of scripture. And that is one simple way that you can build in time to rest and to unwind your soul. It's very, very, very important. Okay, question number three. How do you work in ministry when your husband may not be on the same page? Hmm, that's a good question. Now, I know who this is coming from and may not be on the same page. Now, if that means he's like, absolutely not, not gonna have it and it's creating tension in your marriage or strife, you need to tread very carefully. It needs to be something that you do have as blessing because if he's resentful or it's something that's going to cause contention in your marriage, you've got to be careful. Um, and it, if, if that's the case, let's say your husband's on that space and he's like, absolutely not. I don't want you in ministry, period. No way, no how. But you feel like the Lord's calling you to that. Then that's where I would. Put it before the Lord and say, Lord, if this is what you want me to do, I am willing to obey, but you have to change my husband's heart because I'm not willing for this to cause tension in my home. Or you could say, Lord, I'm going to walk in obedience and I'm going to do this thing. And I'm going to trust you to change my husband's heart because I'm going to obey you first. So you can take either path. You need to go with what you have peace about because you do want to be careful ministry. Your first ministry is to your family. And so it's not a very good message to the world. If you're involved at church, but your family, particularly your husband is resentful of the fact that you're in ministry, but there's that dynamic of the fact that we obey the Lord first. He's our primary first place of, that we obey and our husbands are human and they can be out of step out of sync with what the Lord is asking of us, or maybe your husband's unsaved and he doesn't understand. So that's why there can be two different directions. You can go with this, which they're still similar, still related. They still involve obedience. Um, but I think if your husband's not on the same page in that he just doesn't understand it, or is like, I don't care. I don't want to do it. That's okay. You guys, it's okay to be different from your husband. 
Um, I used to think that we used to have, that we would need to have the same vision and calling on our lives to work together. But the truth is husband and wife, their lives just need to be compatible. I mean, if my husband felt the need to live overseas on missions and I'm like, I'm called to America, well, that would be a problem, right? However, if we both have a heart to do ministry, like right now, my husband and I kind of do different things. He is on staff pastoring at our church. I'm technically considered a pastor. However, I don't really carry any, carry any pastoral responsibilities. And I've set it up that way. Um, well, they set it up that way, but they set it up that way because I'm not paid staff. So they're not, they don't have the right to place a demand on my time because I'm not hired staff. My primary responsibility is caring for, for, for my family and providing for my family, which comes by running my businesses. And so right now I'm a primarily a business person while my husband is primarily a minister. Ministry is in me and it will come out and I volunteer at the church in the capacity that I can. But my primary mission right now is my podcast and building a business that's gonna help support my family and bless people. And then my podcast is the ministry that comes out of me. And so it's okay to be different. It's okay if you're called to the workplace and he's called to ministry or vice versa. And so the the point though, is that whatever you guys are doing, it's important to be on the same page. It's important to talk that through. When I was in fashion, my husband was not on the, on this. He would kind of go back and forth. Some days he'd be like, sure, do the thing. And then sometimes he'd be like, you're outside of God's will by being in the fashion industry because it's a horrible industry. I was like, what? Seriously? He kind of was a roller coaster on that, bless his heart. And so I realized when he would be very antagonizing to the, what I felt was what God had put in front of me being in fashion, because there were so many doors I couldn't have opened for myself and miracles that happened to get me there. I would sit and I, I had to be able to recognize, okay, is this actually about fashion or is there something else underneath that's bothering you? He didn't have as much self-awareness to realize, oh, there's actually something else bothering me. So I had to be able to kind of filter his words and take it with a grain of salt and then really sit and ask him, okay, what is it about me being in fashion that you don't like? And he was like, well, it's just, you're doing this and you're always busy, 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 busy. And I was like, so is the issue the fashion or is the issue that you feel like I'm too busy? And he's like, well, you're, you're busy. And I was like, so if you felt prioritized and whatever that would look like, which we ended up talking about, would you have an issue with me being a fashion? He's like, well, no. And so I was like, okay, so the real issue is he was feeling neglected. So it required a conversation. And in that conversation, I was able to say, okay, what would it take from me to make you feel comfortable with me being in fashion? How, and he, you know, he would get specific, like, well, I want meals cooked when, when I come home and I'm like, okay, all right. We can make that a priority four days out of the week because I can't commit to seven. I just realistically can't commit to that. And he's like, okay, that's fine. So we, we met in the middle and we kind of were able to break down what is, why is it that we're not on the same page? And so I think that's important when, if you want to work in ministry or you want to do anything and your husband's not on the same page, you want to be able to get down to the bottom of it. Why are we not on the same page? Because the reality is your spouse should support you. you just as you should support your spouse. We don't have a right to dictate what our spouse does and doesn't do unless it's harming our relationship. You know what I'm saying? Or it's, or it's a violation of conscience. And so your spouse should be supportive of your desires. If they're resistant, you need to find out why and figure out what's underneath it and how can we resolve that? How can I meet you in the middle and have boundaries in place that will make you feel like it's safe for me to do this thing that I would like to do? Um, and realize that this is an ongoing conversation. It's going to flex and change with the seasons. In fact, I tell my husband every single year when we get to Thanksgiving, I tell him, okay, babe, listen, we're going into the holidays. December is the most psychotic month of our lives from the end of the semester and schools and finals wrapping up to all the Christmas parties, to planning for our own Christmas, to possible travel. I said, it's crazy. And pretty much 95% of it falls on me. So I need you to understand I'm going to be less accessible to you this month. And I need you to be okay with that because I still have businesses to run too, you know? So 
I would have to be forward and, and, and it never fails every time in December at some time, at some point his feelings get hurt and I have to make sure I'm still making him feel like a priority somehow, but I, I do have to keep talking to him and say, Hey, listen, it's not it's just the season. December's crazy. What can we do to kind of touch base? And so we try to build in family time and, and, and protect our schedules as much as possible during the craziness of that month. So the point being, whatever you're doing, if you and your husband are on different projects, you just need to be communicating. You need to be open and honest. You need to ask for their honesty. You need to help them get self-aware. Sometimes husbands and men aren't quite as self-aware as women are. And sometimes it's the other way. Um, and so if he's, you know, hating on your job when really the job's not the issue, it's the feelings of neglect, then help him hone in on that. Um, and get that way you guys can get on the same page. That's very important. Okay, number four. We're going to bust through these. Number four, if I feel called to travel and speak, how do I help my husband be on board with that? Honestly, these are similar responses to the last one. And I've I've had to think through this before. If I'm called to travel and speak, how do I help my husband be on board with that? Now, thankfully, my husband is on board with that. He's like, yeah, that's great. He always asks, are you getting paid for it? It helps if a paycheck is attached, I will say. For some reason, guys, I think they're thinking... If you're going to be gone from me, you need a, there needs to be a benefit for me. And if you're bringing home money, then yay, that's helpful. Um, maybe not all men are like that. Some men might just be like, I'm so happy for you. Do the thing. Um, and so kind of where I've landed is if I'm going to travel and speak, it needs to be something that's paid. That way it blesses my family. I personally have like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't probably travel to speak more than once a month, any more than that, because you know, when you travel, you've got a couple days ahead of time that you're trying to get things done. And then there's a couple days of catch up. So say you're only gone for two days, it's really more like six days of impact. And so if you do that twice a month or three times, it's just becomes a lot. So for me, it's once a month. If I was to do that, thankfully, that's not really a problem at this point. Um, Last year, I did travel quite a bit, but it ended up being about every other month. And so that worked out really great. It didn't seem to be something that threw off the rhythm of our lives. And so you might want to ask your husband, what are some boundaries that need to be in place to help him feel better and, and be real supportive of you traveling and speaking, such as maybe you travel with somebody so you're not alone? That would, it's just always a good idea. Um, not traveling more than once a month or whatever pace feels doable for your family, making sure you get paid such and such amount. Um, maybe that you don't book anything on top of important dates, like the kids' birthdays or your anniversary. You just got to ask yourselves what, what boundaries need to be in place to make this a blessing to my family. That way my husband can be supportive. And it's something that I don't look back on. And say, man, I wish I wouldn't have given away so much time, you know, because your family, again, is your priority. Psst. Hey, it's Jen. Have you ever listened to one of the episodes and thought to yourself, oh, I wish I could leave a response to that. Or I wish I could leave feedback or ask a question. Did you know there's actually a way to do that in Spotify now? I know it's super cool. So if you head over to Spotify and search for Java with Jen podcast or Java with Jen hearing God's voice for everyday life, you may have to search all of it. And then you go and check out my most recent episodes. There are polls and Q&A options that you can weigh in on and I can connect with you that way over here on this platform. I usually use Instagram to connect with you guys, but now with this feature from Spotify, it's a super cool way to engage with the content of each episode and talk to me directly. I'm looking forward to hearing from you guys. So go head over to my latest episodes on Spotify and let's do that right now. Okay, number five. Sorry, I've done three interviews today, so my voice is getting dry. How do I choose what to do at home versus outsourcing and hiring and not let ministry affect home harmony? Let's see. I'm guessing this is for someone who maybe you're busy. I'm guessing maybe ministry could also be business, like whatever you're doing outside of the house. Um I'm going to be very honest about this. You have to realize you have limited energy for the tasks in your day. Raising a family, keeping a house clean, and feeding your family. And then if you do the budget and the finances, that's enough to keep you busy as a full-time job more than full-time. 
So if you're going to work outside the home or you're going to do ministry in a really substantial way, or you're going to build a business, run a podcast, whatever, you need to keep in mind either how to be more strategic with running things in the house or seriously consider which tasks can be hired out, such as cleaning the house. I feel like that's a really easy, easy one to hire out unless you're just very particular. Um, I feel like that doesn't feel so personal. It's lots of people have people that come clean their homes, um, cooking the meals. Maybe that means if it's harder for you to do all the meal planning and prepping and whatever, maybe that means you do one of those box, um, subscriptions where they send the meals to you, or maybe you buy the pre-made meals at HEB. Maybe that means you meal plan once a month for the whole month. And that way it's all out of your head. Maybe that means you have a good friend who does it. Maybe it means you do emails.com where I think, I think it's like you can, emails.com writes the the menu and then they can have it just buy all your groceries at Walmart pickup. I think it's built in like that emails.com. And so there may be different things that you can do, but figure out which tasks that you're willing to delegate and, and designate. I have a friend who, um, she has someone else who homeschools her kids. It's a it's a, a nanny that comes in and homeschools their kids while she works full time. And that's just what they have worked out. It works really well for them. And so that's something that she outsourced slash hired because her kids are little and she doesn't want them in the public school system. And so the point of not letting ministry disrupt your home harmony and doing all these things means that you have to be very, you do have to be forward thinking. It shouldn't cost the family, although I'll just be honest, there are seasons when there's just give and take, and it helps with my husband if I just let him know, hey, I'm in a launch phase right now. I'm launching my my mastermind, and I'm going to be doing a lot of interviews. I'm going to be doing a lot of promotional stuff. I might miss Wednesday night church or because I need the extra hours to work or um let's prioritize Saturday morning coffee together. Let's prioritize whatever. And so you just have to be kind of forward thinking. If ministry is affecting your home harmony and ministry is creating tension in your home, something is out of order. Um, It could be that your husband's not on board and he just won't get on board and you need to find out why. But it's important to realize, like, I know we want to do things outside of the home. Um, and so you need to find out, Lord, if this is something I need to do, then please let this be able to be something my husband can get on board with. Um, now I did, you know, when I was in fashion, it was something I had to just obey the Lord with. I surrendered it many, many times. And the Lord kept saying, this is where I want you. This is where I want you. This is where I want you. And my husband would flip flop about it. And so there was times when it created tension in our home. Uh, But again, like I said, it came down to that. It wasn't so much that he didn't want me in fashion. He just wanted me to prioritize my time better. And I found that that was able to be done if I made sure that he was getting the attention in the bedroom that he needed and that we were having one-on-one time together at least a couple times a week, uh, you know, Saturday morning coffee and talking at the end of the night just whatever it was, checking in with him throughout the day, he's quality time. And so he needed, I needed to protect that. And I needed to make sure the house stayed clean. Uh, If the house feels chaotic, it drives me crazy, but it also makes them feel like I'm not caring for them as much. And so I just had to learn how to prioritize the things that sent the messages to them. You're my priority. And when you figure what that is for your family, build those things into your calendar, like put them on your calendar. That way it's a reminder to you, this needs to happen. And that will help alleviate a lot of the tensions that will come up from life, just snowballing out of control. Okay, doc. Um, Number six, what are some practical steps to get started in business or ministry? Ooh, I like this question. Uh, Well, one practical step It's very personal to me is if you want to start a podcast, coach with me, (laughs) I can help you start a podcast. Um, When it comes to getting started, though, what I would recommend is whether it's business or ministry, you have to take inventory and figure out what is it I'm passionate about? What am I good at? Very 
naturally, what naturally flows out of me? What do people come to me for? Do they come to you for ministry or do they come to you for business? Do they come to you for some kind of coaching? Do they come to you for a certain service? Then pay attention to that and just take inventory. What is it that you daydream about helping with? What is it that you daydream about doing? Pay attention to that. Look at what your strengths are. What brings you joy? Are you good at writing or communicating? Some people will be better at writing than communicating. I am actually pretty decent at both. And so, but I feel like my strength is really in my communication. Um, And so I went podcasting rather than blogging. I do have a blog, but it is not the passion of my life. It's kind of like the junk drawer of my life. I throw things there and if people read them, awesome. (laughs) Um, Are you a good seller? Like, are you great at sales? Do you just get excited about helping people sell their things for a season? I was realizing like, I'm a megaphone. I really am good at taking my skill set and putting it up to people's mouths and, and helping their voice go further. I'm a, I don't know what you call that, but I'm like a megaphone. And so I realized like for a while I did marketing for other companies, um, for a while. I mean, I do a podcast and then I do fashion and the fashion was kind of a way of helping people display their voice of their personality on their clothes. And so figure out what you're good at pastoring, engineering, talking, building, consulting, whatever, and then begin to ask the Lord and brainstorm, how can you turn this into a service to others and and build wealth with it? There are so many ways you can make money online. Some options, if you're a stay-at-home mom or you're a mom who wants to create a side hustle, there are so many options out there. Things like e-commerce. Let's say you have a love for fashion and you want to create an online boutique. There are ways to do that. I recommend if once you hone in on kind of what you want to do, get on YouTube and start looking up videos, how to start an e-commerce store, how to start an online boutique. Um, and you could even put in how to start an online boutique for free. And those will give you the tools that are more affordable and more accessible. You're going to do a lot of learning, um, but you can do it. Now, if you want to start a podcast, seriously, let me help you shortcut the learning curve. Sign up with me. It starts mid-September. I would love to have you as my student. We'll get your show up in 10 weeks and it is designed to help you do it alongside of raising your family or working a job and working a job. Um, So that's how I would recommend. Now, if you want to get into ministry, I am called to ministry. I've always been called to ministry and I've been working in the church the whole time we've been married. Uh, When we were in college ministry, that was probably the most fulfilled season that I had when we were working in regular churches and my husband was the one on payroll and I was not, I always did feel a little bit like a fish out of water. Like I, I never quite found my place um, because I was kind of like, I call it like a side dish. Like he's the pastor. I'm the pastor's wife. So people view me as a pastor, but I didn't carry responsibilities and I never got to preach. And so it just, it was kind of like, I had a title, but no responsibility. So it felt empty. And so I felt very um, frustrated. So that's why I started a podcast because I want to use my gifts, right? And so if you want to get into ministry, start serving somewhere in your church, go to your pastors and say, I want to be in ministry. I want to develop my gifts. How can I do that in the capacity of serving at church? And, And that's if you're like, if you're maybe in the space of, I don't really know, what I want to do, but I want to develop somehow. Serving is the best way to discover it. I have served in probably every department at a church known to man, not bookkeeping. I never worked in the accounting office. I will say that, (laughs) Uh, but it helps me to realize where my skill sets were and to develop certain skills and to develop understanding of what it, what goes into it. I remember in Bible school, I was, it was a joke then, but it's very real. They Half of the training in Bible school was setting up and tearing down chairs. And we thought it was such a waste of time. And now that I'm a pastor, every time I set up and tear down chairs, I'm like, well, they did prepare us for this, didn't they? (laughs) And so if you want to get into ministry, it depends on what you want to do. But serving in your church is one of the best ways to start. If you know what you want to do and you're just looking for an outlet, then start Googling, or you can even, I mean, sit down with me. I would be happy to brainstorm the different things that I've seen done or ways you can get it out. But I do know that usually ministry comes down to different vehicles, video, audio, 
written word. Most ministry comes down to getting the word out in one of those ways. You just need to figure out what you're most comfortable with and what that's going to look like for you. Maybe you become a blogger. Maybe you have a Facebook group and you go live on Facebook. Maybe you have a podcast. Maybe you have a YouTube channel. Whatever it is, just start. And I will say that just start. A lot of times we don't start because we want it to be perfect and we want to be done with excellence, which is good. That's a good quality. But I would say if you wait until it's just excellent and perfect, you will never get started because it will never quite feel like it's ready. And so get started because your audience and the people you're impacting, they will grow with you. If you go back and listen to say episode number four, you're going to see a difference in my episodes, in how I interview, in the graphics, in my intro and outro. You're going to see a difference. And that's okay. That's why I leave those there. It helps me remember the growth that has happened. And people love to grow with you. They love to see you evolve and get better at what you do. So just get started. You just need to start somewhere because you're going to grow in the doing. All right, T. Number seven, what are some boundaries that you've given yourself to protect your rest and take care of the family. I've kind of hit on this a fair bit, but some of the boundaries are, I'm trying to think if I have hard, fast boundaries. One of the things that we've built in is we try to, at least the majority of the nights of the week, we may not get it every night, and I don't get hard on myself for that if we don't get to it every night. Um, But I try to make sure I'm cooking meals for my family multiple times a week just for some sense of togetherness. And so they feel nurtured by me. Um, I try, we try to do powwow time at the end of the night, which can just be five minutes where we all sit on the couch, kind of catch up on life a little bit. We pray together and they go to bed just because it gives that connect point, that sense of connection. Families that do that connect, whether it's over a meal or at powwow time before bed or breakfast before school or whatever it is, those children are far less likely to ever use drugs, get in trouble with the law, have uh, identity issues. You are protecting your children simply by protecting connection. I also uh, try to make sure that I say goodnight to the boys every single night, go in and I kiss them, pray with them. Something simple like that. It gives them the opportunity to talk for a few minutes if something's on their heart um, or if they have questions. And we've had some really great conversations about the Lord and about life in those good night conversations, uh, when they leave, uh, in fact, I've had to get onto my boys about this and, and help them understand when you leave the house, come find me and say goodbye. (laughs) It sounds silly, but that sense of those little touch points throughout the day, when you're connecting those things matter. I try to also text my boys. If I find something funny online, I'll send them the video and be like, oh my gosh, this made me think of you guys. Little things like that tells them, I'm thinking about you. I know you, I see you, I love you. And of course I try to communicate those things all the time. Like you're the best son ever. I'm so proud of you. And using words that are affirming to them. Those are, those might not sound like boundaries but they are boundaries because they're they're proactive boundaries and, and practices that I've put in place to try to build my children so that, they feel taken care of. And that's a way that I help take care of the family that doesn't place a lot of demand on time. Those are simple little things. And then so boundaries to protect my rest. I do prioritize a Sabbath Uh, because I'm a business owner. I can sit down at my computer and work literally any time of the day or night. There's always something to be done. And so I have to intentionally protect 24 hours I'm not working in this 24 hours. And if I start to want to, I say, no, generally God honors the Sabbath. And one thing that made me realize, and I'm going to share this with you guys, because I feel like the idea of the Sabbath has kind of gotten lost in modern day. There was one time that I was working at, at the church doing the marketing there and due to some church travel and an event at the church and blah, 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 it was going to work out that I was going to be working for almost three weeks without a single day off. And at that point, I really needed my paychecks. You know, I, I wasn't, um, I mean, we always need our paychecks, right? But it, it was just important that I, I didn't have any less coming in. And so I, I, I messaged my pastor and I was like, hey, because of this church weekend event, will I be able to have this day off at the office? He said, no, you're a part-timer. You're going to have to do your hours. And I was like, what? so I was very frustrated. Um, 
And I realized, you know what, Jenilee? I mean, that's fair. You don't have time off built in when you're a part-timer. And so I said, Lord. And so I, at first I got mad because then I felt like a slave to my paycheck. I literally felt like a slave for a little bit. And I felt a little powerless. And then I realized, I said, you know what, Lord, the Sabbath was your idea. So Holy Spirit, I'm going to take that day off of work. I'm going to just let them know I'm not coming in. I'm going to take that day off of work and I'm not going to get paid for it. And I'm going to trust that you're going to take care of things anyways. And so it was like a two day window between the weekend event. And then when we traveled for church, it was like Monday and Tuesday. And those were the only days I could have gotten my hours in because I worked two days a week. And so those were only two days I could have got my work. in. so I decided I'll take Monday off and then I'll just work Tuesday. Well, then the pastor came back and he said, Hey guys, I'm going to be giving you guys Tuesday off. You can all have it paid. Even if you're part-time, thank you for working at the church this weekend. And so I said, Oh, that's amazing. Now I get a paid Tuesday and I'm still taking Monday off. And so then somebody, I don't remember how it happened, but somehow the Lord put finances in my hand for that Monday I took off. And so I ended up between the day I was given off and then the money that came to me, I don't even remember how, I ended up making almost twice what I would have made if I had worked both of those days because I made a decision in my heart to honor the Sabbath. And I say that because you need to honor the Sabbath. God built it in because he knows how we're built. He, he built us to need a Sabbath. God himself took a Sabbath. Who do we think we are to think we don't need a Sabbath, you know? So 24 hours is what is required of us to take off and not work, not toil. And so I try not to run errands all day for the kids. They are real good about running me to death. And I will tell them, no, it is my Sabbath. I'll maybe run errands for two hours, but no, beyond that, I'm resting. And I will find things to do that refresh my soul. So that is one boundary I have given myself to make sure that I am resting. Another idea of how you can protect rest and take care of the family is you need to reverse engineer your calendar with what is top priority first. So look at your calendar when it's a fresh month and build in the important things. Are there family nights? Is there a holiday that you have holiday um, scheduled? Is there a birthday? Is there date nights? Build those things onto your calendar first. Maybe your kid has a field trip and you want to go with them to have some time with them. Maybe you're taking your child on a date. Whatever it is, build it in first. And then with the rest of my calendar, I time block what is going to be done. So I time block out Wednesday night for church unless I have to miss it for some reason. Or I time block Sunday. I time block my Sabbath. And then with everything I do have to do, I time block those in. And then I say Mondays, I work on my podcast so that they're ready to go by Tuesdays. Uh, Tuesdays, I work on my marketing. Uh, Wednesdays, I do my coaching program, you know, whatever it is. I time block in, these hours are designated to this. I time block in working out because the Lord has put on my heart the need to be a good steward of my body. And so I need to go to the gym at least twice a week and do a couple of workouts two other days a week and do some stretching and walking the other days of the week. And so that has to be built in. And so I build in, I time block my bedtime and my wake up time and my quiet time. So building those things in, your life won't always obey your calendar. But if it's on the calendar, it really helps you to make sure that you're prioritizing what needs to be prioritized. Okay, last question. How do you build connections or how have you built connections in the business world? Ooh, I love this question. Literally prayer is the number one way I've built connections in the business world. And I'm not even joking. There was one time when I was in, in fashion and I was like, Lord, I need to meet people who are in fashion, who are faith filled that I can connect with in this space. And I couldn't find any pastors online that were doing fashion. And I was like, man, I'm kind of alone here. Well, then I read, I felt prompted that day to go read the Elijah list website. And there's a prophetic word on there for people in their sixties. So I didn't, wasn't relevant to me, but I read it anyways. And at the bottom, it said Gina Lamort uh, by prophetess Gina Lamort, who is a fashion designer and celebrity wardrobe stylist. And then it had her email address. And I was thinking to myself, <gasps> gangbusters, this is God. And so I emailed her. Gina never emailed me back. So I, I was disappointed, but I was like, well, Lord, that's okay. I'll just trust you if I need to be connected her. 
Well, I noticed about a month later, maybe two months later, she started following me on Instagram. I thought maybe she finally read the email and is not good at email. So she decided to just start following me. Turns out one of her friends, and it was around when we flooded with Hurricane Harvey, one of her friends saw one of my posts about Hurricane Harvey and forwarded my post to Gina and said, Gina, you are going to love this girl's story. It's heartbreaking, but what the Lord is doing is so beautiful. You need to follow her. So Gina started following me. Well, then I reached out after we are friends on Instagram, I reached out and I began a conversation with her in messenger. And we began to realize the connection that we had had that, uh, started with me reading that article. Well, then last year I ended up in New York to rescue a friend who'd gotten caught up in a, in a cult or something. And Gina turns out lived only 45 minutes from where we were and was on the way home. So we took a little bit went a little bit out of our way, not really. And I got to meet Gina for the first time. And we have been friends online for years, five years, and we finally got to meet. And so I was very excited, but that is one way that the Lord connected me. Another way that I've built connections in the business world is you have to be assertive about reaching out. I am friends with the owner of Prosperity Denim and um, uh, she has like five denim lines or whatever. And I'm friends with her because I would post and tag online whenever I would use their stuff. And I built a relationship with her social media manager who, because she loved my content I was sharing. And sometimes she would ask for me to take pictures and send them content for their uh, social media page. Well, then when I realized they were in Los Angeles, I took the initiative and I said, hey, I'm going to be in Los Angeles. I would love to meet you guys or see the headquarters or the warehouse or whatever. I would just love to kind of lay my eyes on everything. And she said, well, let me talk to Michelle. So she contacts the CEO, the owner, and Michelle said, sure, let me carve out two hours in my calendar and I'll take you around and tell you our story. So she hosted me for two hours in Huntington Beach. It was a beautiful space. She was precious. And when we left, my sister said, she said, generally, that was like talking to you in 10 years. That's crazy. She and you are so similar. It was really funny. But I say that like even other podcasters, people where I see their shows or I like their content online. Nowadays, it's the world is so much smaller and you can connect with people simply by reaching out. Same thing uh, on social media. There was one gentleman I had on my show. His name's Manuel Reyes. And he was, he's the husband of Angela Johnson, the comedian who does Bon Qui Qui and the nail salon. Anyways, so I started following him on social media after I saw him and his wife in a movie together. Uh, I think it's called Mom's Night Out. And one day I saw him posting on Instagram. Now I, I had my intercessors pray the day before. I said, I would like to meet a celebrity and have them on my show as a guest. Could you guys be praying that the Lord connects me to a celebrity? And they said, sure. So the next day, Manuel's posting about podcasting. I start answering his questions. So he and I started a conversation on Instagram and I gave him as much value as I could, as much feedback as I could. At the end, I said, you know, Manuel, it's funny. It's actually been a dream of mine to have you and your wife on my podcast. Would you be interested in coming on my show? And he said, you know, I can't speak for her. She's busy. She's on tour, but I'd be happy to come on your show. And so he did. He was my first celebrity interview. And he said, even Angelo was asking him, what's different about this podcast? Why did you decide to be on this podcast? You get invited all the time. And he goes, I don't really know. I, I don't know. I just felt like I needed to say yes. And I was like, that's the Holy Spirit. And so just, I reach out and, and you build those relationships. People are people everywhere. And if you want a relationship, you just got to build it. The Bible says that he who has friends is himself friendly. And that applies to the business world. And so networking is key. The difference, I, I read this one time and I'll end, end with this. The difference between a millionaire and a billionaire is how you handle your relationships. And so there was this man who was at this big, huge business conference and he was seated at a table with one of the world's billionaires. And he said he was very humble. And he asked him, he said, sir, may I ask you a question? I just have one question. He said, there are some men who are millionaires, but you're a billionaire and you were a millionaire at one point. He said, what would you say is the one key that makes the difference between a millionaire and a billionaire? 
And he looked at him and he said, that's a very smart question. And he said, the one thing that is key is how you can handle, nurture, and maintain relationships. He said, nothing in life comes without relationships. It's all about who you know and who they know and, and how you have nurtured that relationship. And so networking, not just for yourself, but networking to care for and serve others is the key to expansion and growth. And that just really stuck with me, but it applies in business. It applies in ministry. It applies everywhere. If your priority is to serve people, and that's how I built these relationships, really the prosperity denim. I was serving them by cre creating social content for Manuel. I was serving him by answering his questions about podcasting for Gina. I was serving her through, um, praying for her and different things. And, and I was creating content that was inspiring to her. So, and then as we built a relationship, I was able to serve her more by praying for some specific things that we saw the Lord answer multiple things. And so serving people is the key to having relationships that matter. And it's part of how you build connections, whether you're in the business world or the ministry world. So I love y'all's questions. Thank you for sending these in. I hope my answers helped you. If you have any other questions after listening to this episode, you can actually drop that feedback in um, an email to me or right there in the Spotify app. It has the ability to ask questions and to leave a voice message to me. And if you do, then I can actually incorporate that into an episode, which I think is super cool. Um, so if you're a podcast Spotify listener, that's something you can do. If you're on Apple, just go find me on Instagram and just drop me your question in, uh, in Messenger, in the direct messages, and I will build it into another episode if I get enough questions from you guys. So stay tuned because next week I'm going to be interviewing a mom who is a working mom. She has young children and she built a podcast with me. And I want to see what her responses would be because she's in a different space than I am. I was not working full time when I did these things. And uh, my kids were a little bit older than hers are now. And so I would love to hear her responses and how she might inspire you. She's full of wisdom. And I think you're going to enjoy her story. So thanks for listening. And I look forward to seeing you guys in next week's episode. Make sure you're subscribed to uh, Java with Jen podcast anywhere that you listen to the podcast that way you don't miss any upcoming episodes and again if you're interested right here the podcast plan if you're interested in starting a podcast with me as your coach this starts in September you can go to Java with Jen podcast.org to book a call with me and see if this is something that will work for you I would love to be your coach and help get your voice out into the world and help you build your dreams all right until next time see you guys later love you Thanks so much for tuning in to today's show. Listen, let's stay connected. Come follow me on Instagram at Java with Jen, where you can follow the latest and say, hey, it's a really great way to stay in touch. Many of you have also asked how you can support the show. You can make donations through the Anchor app or on Patreon, or of course, by sharing, rating, and reviewing on social media and iTunes as well. Your heartfelt feedback always reminds me why I do this. Also, don't miss our merch store where you can get super cool Java with Jen swag and coffee. Find it at javawithjenmerch.com. Until next time, remember, hearing God's voice is simple and he wants to be a part of your everyday life. See you next week.